When Caitlin Moran was out promoting her series of books about women and feminism, she would often encounter the same question from audiences at the end of the event. What about men? At a time when people can claim that men actually have it harder than women in some respects, what advice did she have for them? So she went away, spoke to male friends, did the research, and came back with her thoughts. We sat down to talk about the strange ways men talk to each other, the dangers of the manosphere, and what positive aspects of masculinity we should be celebrating. Caitlin, uh, the last time I saw you was actually four years ago, it turns out. I filmed an interview with you for How To Be Famous, and at the time it was decided that it would make far more sense for you to do that interview with my female colleague, Martha, and yes. she did a fantastic job. I'm very pleased that you finally got around to writing a book so that I can talk to you. Right. Uh, exactly. You can talk all the people all the time if you can possibly do it. Sometimes there might be a queuing system and you might have to wait a bit. And so one gender's had their fill and I can move on to the other. But in the end, <laughs> everyone has to get a slice of catmo pie. <laughs> Here I am with my battered proof of, of what about men. And um, I found there's an absolutely brilliant read entertaining as I would have expected but also really interesting and of course as a father of two teenage now boys completely fascinating yes. because I know about my world and the time that I grew up in but I'm living through a completely different time now with my own children and it's much much harder uh, I think for them and as you deal with in this book there are all sorts of things that get kind of thrown at them and it, it, it could be quite tricky territory to negotiate um normally when I'm working through a book I sort of you know make little notes and look out passages and stuff like that and with this one I just thought I just want to talk about the whole thing so I was just like I just look at the chapter titles yeah, yeah. we haven't got time to do that but um I I'll pick out a few things and I thought the first thing was uh which is sort of almost where you start which is the way that men talk to each other yes which I find fascinating I should stay say actually before we start I went to a school that for reasons we won't go into now was predominantly women girls so five to one ratio girls to boys so I'm quite a weird boy in that I don't really talk like a boy I talk very much more like a girl I'm yes. much happier talking with women and I have that thing where you know the sort of like you can imagine the suburban party that happens in people's houses yes. and there's this gender divide happens where the men go over there to talk about bikes and football and lycra yeah. and stuff and yeah. the women go over here to talk about the interesting stuff. And I always kind of gravitate over there because that's where I want to be. That's Why do men talk so weird? <laughs> it's really interesting. You can always tell a man he was brought up mainly around women. Like either they had like bigger sisters or they went to a predominantly female school or they had they were raised by a single mother and that's, they were only child. Because they're the ones that when you're a woman, you're talking to them. And five minutes in, you're like, oh, he, he knows these conversational skills. <laughs> Women are very good at code switching. Like we do still live in a sort of male dominated society and like particularly women in my generation when you were growing up when I went to work for the music press in London in the nineties, like you just had you know, that's why ladettes were invented because it was a male dominated world and women were just like, Well, if I want to be in this industry, I'm just basically gonna to have to like behave like a man. Yeah. So we can code switch. But and but it's rarer to find a man that can code switch and talk and do lady talk um, than it is to find a woman who can go and do bloke talk. Mm. Um, and I do think it's interesting that you pick that as the first thing to kick off on because I do think it's at the root of kind of everything that I've written about in the book and the problem that I perceive that men and boys are in at the moment. It's the way that you communicate. Yeah, you look at when we sort of when when you hear young men saying it's easier for women now sort of feminism has gone too far women are winning it's it's harder to be a man than a woman now what they're acknowledging is that over the last hundred years women's lives have changed so much you know we've got the vote you know we can run companies we get education kind of like we can wear trousers we can go into space we can smoke cigarettes we can talk about sex men's lives have not changed mm. That much at all. Men's lives are still basically as they would have been for their grandfathers 100 years ago. There hasn't been this expansion of what a boy can be in the way that has been utterly with girls. And the reason that women were able to invent feminism and use it to progress their lives is because you put two women together for 30 seconds, they will immediately go to the deep shit. They're immediately <laughs> like, my cesarean went wrong. My birth was like this. My, you know, my, my kids have just been sort of like, they've, they've just found out they've got ADHD. Like my mother's got dementia. We go straight into the big stuff. We mm. will confess anything. That spirit of the ladies' toilets where you can yeah. talk about anything and then other women will join in and go, me too, me too. 
And then you start talking about solutions. First of all, you analyze why it happens and then you go into solutions. And it's absolutely inherent into the way that women communicate, that we confess our biggest secrets. We talk about taboo subjects, dark and difficult stuff. Then we and then we analyze why it's happening and then we change it. Men don't have that because from a very early age, you are told to basically stop talking about your emotions, man up, stop crying, stop sniveling, stop being whimsical, you know, and and you either have to be angry or you do banter. And yeah. banter, although I love banter, I'm always happy to get on the banter bus to banterbury and be banter calls, but <laughs> it, you can't have all your conversations in a banter mode. And I think very often men are. They're either bantering or they're exchanging information with each other. The banter thing is weird, isn't it? And as you say, what happens is that boys hear banter. They are spoken about in a bantery way from birth. Yes. And it continues throughout their lives. And that means they're very adept at banter themselves. But it's a sort of way of not really talking about anything. Totally, totally. It's a pro. It's it's like it's like emotional air text over a crumbling wall. Like kind of like, and in some circumstances it works well. Like I've got a whole chapter about banter, how it starts. As you say, you know, we teach our, from a young age. Little boys are surrounded by banter. Like you know, as I put in the book, the first thing that a boy who has just been born will probably hear is either uh, someone going, "Oh, he takes after his dad." Oh, look at that, he's got nothing to be ashamed of, and someone going, "That's the umbilical cord." And then they go, "Oh no, it's just banter." And then you put them on the breast, just going, "Oh, he's like." He's dad, he's a tip man, he loves your jubblies. We just don't say that to little girls. We don't comment on their vaginas when they come out. And we don't go, oh, she loves tits, she's a little lesbian. Like, so <laughs> the very first moment, even as a child, the first words you're hearing as a boy are banter. Yeah. And, and that's that's the sort of, that's that's what we encourage all the way through their, through their childhood. So by the time they sort of like start heading towards puberty and adolescence and all these anxieties and worries and fears, you know, these vulnerabilities, this need to be tender, there is no language to express it. You would seem like an outlier if you suddenly came into school and went, I'm really worried about the size of my willy or the idea of having sex or my, you know, my parents breaking up or that I'm really short, uh, you know, kind of like there just, there isn't a, 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 there isn't a way, there isn't a template for that kind of conversation. Right. And that's, you know, politics can't change that. Economics won't change that. That's a job of culture. Yeah. You know, we need to see templates for these kind of conversations on TV shows and in books and in films, which is why I love my job because, you know, I can take part in that to some extent. I can go, here's how we need to start talking. You know, do you like, do you like this way of talking? Does this work? And what I noticed with how to be a woman is that I talked about being a woman and feminism in a different way to what we'd done before. It was sort of inclusive. It was funny. It seemed like a fun thing to join in on rather mm. than a, a dutiful piece of like moral fiber that you had to absorb. And, and I wanted, I hopefully that's what I've done in this book. I've found a way to start talking about men's problems where someone can hand one of these chapters to a man in their life or a teenage boy in their life and go, well, Catelyn says this about porn or Catelyn mm. says this about body image or Catelyn says this about the clothes that men wear. What do you think? And that's what your job should be, really, as a writer, is to start a conversation and show a template, set a t- make a space and set a tone and then go, this is what we're talking about today. And we're doing it in this way, in a friendly, warm way, with no blame, but a sense of urgency that mm. we've got a generation for whom the main conversations they are hearing about men and boys are conversations that Andrew Tate is starting. Um, and I, 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 we really need to, with our generation, your generation, my generation, we need to be really aware that we have let that vacuum open up, that we have not had a good, liberal, progressive, constructive conversation about the problem of boys and men, and into that vacuum, Andrew Tate has stepped. Yes, we we will get to Andrew Tate. I have on my notes in, in bold uh, type, Andrew Tate, and Jordan Peterson, so viewers have got that uh, joy to come. But <laughs> very honest in the book, sort of saying that, obviously, as somebody who is a woman and who has been raising daughters, that you needed to go and talk to your male friends you know to sort of find out from them what was their childhood like what is their manhood and adulthood like uh, what were the things that they were going through and one of the you've also done some sort of more academic research in a way and one of the things that really struck me is your sort of discovery about the fine motor skills that, that girls develop much faster than boys which means that in school they are able to handwrite and therefore get on with schoolwork in a way that boys genuinely struggle with because of something as simple as that. And that that has a big impact on their schooling. But also, of course, as we say, this this way that they communicate because they're not used to doing it in that way. They they develop their banter instead. That was really that really shocked me. And it, and it made me feel a bit sad, actually, because I thought, well, that's just a huge handicap, isn't it? If you don't if you are just simply physically struggling. I, I say this as somebody who literally cannot write anymore. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad it hit home. I was really hoping like that of all the sort of, because I think that's the, there's lots of things in the book that I'm really happy with and proud of, but that was the bit where 
I really felt that I was onto something to mm. try and explain what the big gaps are between boys and girls, particularly in academic achievement, which then sort of has this sort of like, you know, pile on effect all the way through the rest of your lives. And it was finding out this that, and as you know, anyone will know from going into a school, when boys handwriting and girls handwriting is up on the walls, <laughs> girls handwriting is all very neat and kind of has a flow and boys will literally look like someone threw a pencil at a paper, you know, nine times out of 10, because boys brains develop differently and they develop fine motor skills much later. So then this sets off a domino effect because if boys can't write, then that's very much linked to reading. So you're kind of like you're on a delay from girls. And if you see that you're failing immediately, if you're turning up at school and you literally cannot do this thing and you feel like you're failing and you're getting being punished for it and getting extra homework, then this makes you feel alienated from writing, which makes you feel alienated from reading. And then you see the difference. Girls are reading books, you know, the classic books for girls, things like, you know, Anne of Green Gables or Little Women, which is sort of very small personal domestic vignettes about how to cope with social embarrassment or your, your siblings. Mm. Whereas boys, the research shows, that tend to go on and read stuff that is much more text light. Uh, and more graphic like comic books which are all about getting plans and blowing things up and working in a gang and like bantering when you know an alien tries to shoot you and so then you follow this all the way through life and you sort of you, you hit adolescence and you've just got girls being able to have these very deep emotional conversations about sort of like you know the actualities of being a teenage girl whereas the stories that boys have been reading are usually superhero ones yeah like kind of where and where which i think then sets up a very poisonous time bomb because the constant narrative in those in, in superhero books is usually there's a teenage boy he feels weird he's struggling with life and then suddenly a huge secret is revealed to him you come from another planet and there is a shadowy conspiracy on this planet and you must now try and save everyone and that i think is is why you know things like sort of like the these red pill conspiracy theories in the matrix yeah. are so popular with misogynist sort of you know o online men because that's a template of a story that boys have got programmed into them to believe that that's like an uber narrative like oh yeah this is why I feel weird. It's not just because I'm a gonky teenage boy, because there's a massive conspiracy theory against boys. Yeah. Where girls feel like gonky teenage girls. They're like, oh yeah, I remember Joe March and Little Women felt really sort of awkward as well. So I guess I'll just learn to make some friends and like kind of, you know, I'll go to the school and try and do some chat. Like it's a totally different set of information that we give girls and boys. Yeah, and yeah. That very early developmental difference and if i was going to invent feminism for men you know we've done amazing things in talking about the physical disadvantages women have with say periods and we now provide free you know sanitary wear for girls in schools why are we not putting the same effort into the physical disadvantage boys have in that they learn to write later like mm. that, that's a huge campaign there straight mm. away that we need to acknowledge it's really interesting that, as you say that if if we don't make the effort there is this sort of vacuum into which People like Andrew Tate or Jordan Peterson can obviously fill with whatever it is they want to say. And I suppose there's also that thing as well, isn't there, where social media, you know, now that we have teenagers who will, uh, the vast majority of them will have access probably to some kind of smartphone. And that means that they could be getting any sort of information uh, from social media or from websites. And then, of course, also we get into the realms of pornography, because, of course, we all know that a phone does technically give you access to anything that you can type into a search engine. Oh, yeah. Let's start with bodies first, because I think it's really interesting to see how boys now get a lot of information about their bodies or what they should look like or how they should function and all the rest of it from online whether and from the culture, and that the culture has changed. So I was looking recently at some classic films because my one of my sons is really into sort of looking at film. And if you look at film stars from the sort of 70s, uh or 60s they are not these kind of hench built they're they're very good looking men but they're not you know physically uh like that whereas now of course we're so used to seeing these actors go through these huge physical transformations for films not even just the superhero ones just anything anytime ryan gosling takes his top off you're just like wow how how does that work? You know, and it, it's not real, but that's the information they're getting from the culture. And then elsewhere, of course, there are these huge swathes of fitness influencers or lifestyle coaches and all the rest of us telling boys that they need to be in the gym, eating this, that and the other. And it, I find it slightly terrifying. Well, absolutely. And you can see, you know, once you've adjusted your eye to it, you see it everywhere. So like even you walk into almost any like health food shop or even supermarket now, and there's those massive barrels of protein powder yeah like kind of the gym culture you've got to eat your protein you've got to be hench and as i put in the book like you know the heroes that i grew up with were like han solo and luke skywalker and like you know han solo looks like he's about to lean on the wall of the millennium falcon and just go i am knackered 
<laughs> and Luke Skywalker looks like the kind of slim, callow youth who writes poetry in his spare time. Whereas <laughs> even in the re- reboots of the merch from Star Wars, the original dolls look look like Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. The modern ones they put out now, yeah. Luke Skywalker's wearing a top that's open to the navel and has these massive muscles. Yeah. And there's this kind of like literal arms race for like, you know, you don't see a normal looking man now. And in, in the book, I talk about how I went for a very long and boozy lunch with the director of like a massive superhero franchise. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, you know, we talk all the time and we acknowledge now that like, you know, female actresses have to basically starve themselves in order to, to be in films. And that's terrible. But it's actually harder for the male stars because mm-hmm. to put on the kind of muscle mass that you need to be in a superhero movie, you're in the gym for four or five hours a day in between shooting. The amount of protein you're eating is making you incredibly constant you're in so much pain from these workouts that you're in ice baths at the end of it on the day of shooting you have to dehydrate yourself to make the muscle definition stronger yeah and even top athletes are not having these kind of regimes but then these people are expected to act and then boys go and watch these films and they think well that's because all you're looking for when you're like 11 12 13 is this information how do i become an adult how do i become a man and if those are the men that you see on your screen you you just presume that's who you'll have to be because if you, if you don't become that then what are you? Yeah. The, the difference between men and women at the moment is that like women have spent the last 10 or 15 years of this new wave of feminism absolutely taking the piss out of female body ideals. Like uh, the whole body positivity movement, social media is full of girls shooting their roles and their stretch marks and being very realistic about it. Every female comedian stand up has a 10 minute routine about kind of how actresses have to starve themselves. Women have pulled the, you know, the, the curtain back from that. And we're talking about it. Yeah. I can't think of any male comedians or cultural commentators that are being really honest about the fact that every man you see on the screen is an absolutely unachievable, dangerous and painful body ideal. Yeah. That if any 11 year old boy tries to set off on the path to look like that, he's just going to have an absolutely miserable life and fail yeah. because he doesn't have personal trainers and his, and his parents will not be able to afford the huge amount of chicken breasts they'll have to eat every day <laughs> with protein quota <laughs> I do remember actually when Chris Pratt did the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie there was the sort of picture of him stood, stood there shirtless and, and muscly and he was asked you know what's that look on your face and he said that's hunger I'm right? so hungry in that picture because I've had to starve myself um, but as you say, you do need more people like that sort of saying, this is not real. This is not possible. You know, I'm on a stupid regime. Um, and that sort of honesty is absolutely crucial throughout this book in, in talking about these difficult subjects. Sex, of course, is such a massive topic. It ta- it does take up you know a good chunk of this book. You talk in, in sort of two ways about sex. One is to do with sex in relationships, sort of, and particularly the idea of sexual assault, mm. so that we now live in a time where boys say that they are terrified of being accused of sexual assault at school or sort of just after school whatever um and you make the point that of course women are terrified of men because that's statistically who is most likely to harm them it's not a stranger in the street it's going to be the person who's in their mobile phone contact list and the, there's that thing of sort of having to have honest conversations about about sex and this real problem where schools cover some of it but not all of it parents maybe aren't paying the best attention to their kids needing this information much earlier than you might expect it's a tricky area isn't it oh hugely and again like it's it's one of those things where you're like the most important thing is that we make a space and create a tone like kind of like again in women over the last 10 years like you know the conversations I can have with my teenage daughters about sex because of a who I am and the way that I talk, but because the culture in general, yeah. you can have very frank and open conversations about sex in a way that I just don't think we've been able to template for boys. Um, and and then on top of that, the fact that parents almost always underestimate how early you need to be having these conversations. Like in the converse, in the chapter about pornography, like kind of, I think most parents think, oh, I should start talking about porn. Maybe they're sort of twelve or thirteen. They're watching this stuff at school at eight or nine. Yeah. They will always be a big boy at school who will come up and show you a phone and go look at this and show you something horrible mm. um so you know we need to be having those conversations earlier and also there's a there's a huge reticence to tackle the really dark stuff like for instance sexual strangulation is yeah. such a common trope now not only from like you know teenage girls that i talk to which is how common it is that that will be part of their sex lives with their partners but women of my age who are newly divorced who are going back out onto the dating scene for the first time in 20 years and they're going oh my god it's really changed out there like yeah. you know, in the 90s when i was dating no one would ever you know suggest strangulation as part of sex and now it's just you know across the board like you know sort of like seven out of ten times that I've been on a date it's, it's been something that's been discussed or someone's just done it yeah this is such a 
and you know I think people are very weary of you know wary of kink shaming and like kind of like to start these difficult conversations but the simple facts are that there are 60 women who are known to have died from sexual mm. strangulation that has gone wrong yeah and that's just what's on the official statistics very often in murder cases you have the 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 man say yeah no it was just rough sex that went wrong mm. and that's why and then, so, you know, if you go back around in the circle, you see, you know, 12 and 13 year old boys are very worried that sex will go wrong for them, that they will be accused of rape falsely. It's like, well, then we need to start having the conversation honestly about what kind of things are going to put you in danger. Yeah. And like, A, strangling someone is going to put you in massive danger, even if it's totally consensual. This is a really dangerous, risky thing for a young, non-medically trained person to do. Like, you don't want to, with the, you know, even if it was totally consensual, have someone pass out or die yeah. just because you're having sex. If you both want to be giddy, that's great. Just do what all the other previous generations have done and either hold your breath or use poppers. Like, you know, I'm a bit old-fashioned about kind of like, you know, <laughs> weird. Um, and similarly, you know, if you're worried about false rape accusations, then, you know, the, you know, it is a really old-fashioned piece of advice if you're in a, you know, if you're in a, mutually trusting established relationship it's very unlikely that the person you've been having sex with is suddenly going to turn up at school and go you know i was raped or sexually assaulted yeah um, and also as well you know and another thing that i've never seen anyone talk about like kind of i've heard so many men go yeah crazy girls they're the best ones for having sex with like you always you know, crazy chick they're like freaks in bed that's who you want to be having sex with like if you're a 13 year old boy that's worried you might be accused of sexual assault don't date someone who clearly has massive mental issues. I'm just going to be your mum here now and say like, he needs therapy and possibly medication, and you shouldn't be feeling horny when you look at her. Like kind of like that's outside your pay grade. <laughs> don't just leave the, the you know the, the troubled ladies. Just don't have sex with them. Just let them get the help that they need. Your <laughs> is not going to really help out in this massive crisis that they're having. <laughs> the thing you point out, which is really interesting, is that the 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 porn industry, which is, of course, such a problem for t- teenage boys growing up now, the, to the point where it can have a real impact on their ability to actually have a good sex mm-hmm. life, weirdly, might actually provide the template for the best form of consent. Because, of course, porn is a very controlled thing when it's being made on, on the most part. And therefore, of course, everything is decided beforehand. It is fake and all that sort of stuff. And it's sort of you know, it, everything is worked out and therefore there is never going to be an accusation of sexual assault after that because it's all been cleared. But it's it's a weird thing, isn't it, that porn is sort of both the problem and the potential solution. Certainly. Well, that, I mean, that's why I suggest, like, you know, if you're getting your, all your ideas from sex from porn, like, here's the big idea that you should get from porn. Like, kind of like, they literally write down in advance what they're going to do. Like, it is discussed. You know, yeah. they are at work. You know, they are trained to do the things they have done. Like, if it doesn't work, they stop. So, like, that would be, you know, that you need to look at the mechanisms of porn. I think that's a very useful thing in terms of your sex life, rather than just doing what you're seeing on screen, which is which is not sex, it's pornography. It's yeah. different. Those are people at work. Like, kind of like, your sex will be very different to that. <laughs> I, I really hope. But I do find it dolorous that, like, kind of like, we've basically, I hear so many young girls going, I never want to have sex. Because if you were an 11-year-old girl and you watched some extreme pornography, or just some quite average pornography, you would just think, I never want that to happen to me. Yeah. And Similarly, if you were a young boy and you're just seeing this man with like a very unrealistic willy and huge muscles who's throwing a woman around, never talking, never, show, never showing any vulnerability, never showing any tenderness, mm. never showing any worry, there's no conversation, that would look like an equally terrifying thing to do as well. Like yeah. kind of, it, it's the most human thing two people can do. And yet we seem to have completely dehumanised it and therefore made it absolutely terrifying to young people. Yeah. And the fact that we've managed with all our technology and brains to screw up humans having sex when foxes have sex on shed roofs in the rain <laughs> and, and seem to be having a far better time, judging by the ones that were outside my house last night, is <laughs> just extraordinary to me. How have we screwed up young, horny, beautiful people having sex this badly? It is maddening. Um, we'll we'll move on now to the, the, a couple of those names that we mentioned near the beginning. Um, I, I think we'll probably start as you do with with Jordan Peterson, um, who is a, an interesting man. Of course, here I am on the Watertones podcast, so I'm here, you know, representing a bookseller who who sells those books, and they are very very popular books. Lots of people buy those books, um, but as you say, as somebody who's read through them, they're filled with some. Uh, interesting stuff a lot of it actually from other philosophers and other f- fonts yeah. of knowledge and then it's filled with some really odd stuff and I think the thing that I always see as you have is that when you see him talking he just looks miserable yes. what he's describing sounds miserable and and you kind of think that if we are supposed to be taking that person as the kind of 
uh, messiah, the person who's delivering the, the, the things that you need to hear if you're a man, it doesn't seem to be working out so well. <laughs> no, very much not. Like kind of like, I mean... I mean, he. I mean, I've literally got the page open here in the book where I'm just like. So basically, he's a very depressed, anxious, fundamentalist Christian academic. He was becoming increasingly radicalized. If you look at his Twitter feed now, it's just full of climate change denial, rank transphobia, yeah. and this really weird belief that Justin Trudeau, the president of uh, of Canada, is like some kind of antichrist. It's like it's Canada. It can't be that bad. <laughs> But like kind of, but his main thing is that life is miserable and that suffering is absolutely necessary. So I just sort of, you know, I did a brief skim through like quotes and it's sort of like page 58, we are fallen creatures. Page 61, life is awful. Work <laughs> than that of an animal. Only the gods can bear it. Page 225, violence is no mystery. It's peace that's the mystery. Page 149, everyone is destined for pain. Page 161, life is suffering. I mean, it goes on. So he's not, He's not a cheerful Charlie and, you know, not, you know, someone who's that dolorous about life, I would not want around my children anyway. And secondly, until I read his stuff, I'd had so many people coming up to me going, but what do you think about Jordan B. Peterson? Like mm. kind of like saying interesting things about the life of men. And as I put in the book, and as you will know, working for Water Sense, there is a section about women in every bookshop in the world. Huge section that encompasses, you know, physical stuff, mental health, feminism, memoir, women. There is no man section. Mm books because generally men don't write books to other men that have advice in them women will buy three or four self-advice books a year self-help books like we, we that is our industry we love this stuff men very rarely have a book written for them mm. so when someone like jordan b peterson comes along and there isn't much competition the fact that anyone is talking about the problems of men means that he kind of isn't analyzed in the same way that we would analyze a woman who is giving advice to men so he's kind of given a free pass and then the fact that on top of that you know he's an academic time magazine called in the most influential intellectual of our age but intellectually, and again, you know, I, I I didn't go to school, let alone university. I'm from a council estate in Wolverhampton. But I'm just flicking through this thing going, for an intellectual, this is sloppy as. Like his main thesis about the difference between the, the main drive for men is that men are naturally aggressive and must always win. Because if they don't, they become depressed and ruined. And he bases this on a study of lobsters, where if a lobster is in a fight and loses a single fight with another lobster, it, its serotonin levels drop to the point where its brain becomes liquid and it, and it forms a different brain and it's eternally a loser. And he goes, this is why, and this is what men are like. You know, men are like male lobsters. If, if they lose a single fight, they will come depressed. That's why you must always try and win every fight and always be aggressive. I mean, so many points here. First of all, <laughs> we are not lobsters. We diverged from them evolutionarily 800 million years ago. Secondly, we don't have di gigantic, delicious hands. Thirdly, <laughs> we force out of our eyes. Fourthly, if human beings were like lobsters and we got depressed when we lost, every sporting tournament in the world would be a bloodbath where you would see people who'd been brain damaged because they'd lost. Like, even playing Scrabble with your family would mean that everyone who played who lost would become brain damaged and their, their, their brain would become soup. It's just, it, it's so fallacious and thin. And like, and it's a recurrent trope in like in, in badly written books where you take one example from the animal kingdom and then extrapolate that that is what humans are like. And like, as soon as you see someone doing that, you should just stop reading their book because you can do that with anything. Like there, there are a billion different kind of life forms on earth. They're doing all kinds of crazy things. There are hornet wasps that can vibrate so much that they can cause fire out of their bums. We can't do that. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to anybody who's telling me that we need to learn something from wasps. And similarly, I'm not going to learn any learn anything from someone who says we need to learn from lobsters. So, so it doesn't work, and he's not analysed in the same way that we would any woman who was giving advice, even someone who was turning up on this morning. You know, we've analysed Gwyneth Paltrow saying that you need to steam your vagina with far more rigour than we have this man, who is supposed to be the premier intellectual of our time, telling young men and boys how they need to live their lives. Um, I, 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 I mean, I've written a huge amount about him, but essentially he's a misogynist. His, the subtitle to 12 Rules to Life is an antidote to chaos. And it turns out that order is masculine and chaos is feminine. Right. And so it's an antidote to chaos. It's an antidote to female traits. And I would suggest he needs more female traits. He needs to be a bit more cheerful. He needs to crack on with Tuesday. <laughs> he's not believing that life is suffering. And he needs to stop comparing humans to lobsters. It's just like why <laughs> Oh man! I mean, uh, the other person, of course, who who is very keen to talk about what male traits are and and why they should be sort of celebrated is Andrew Tate. Yeah. Um, and I I watched again his recent BBC interview, and um, I realised that these were the words that I hear mentioned all the time now by young boys, 
um, uh, as to what what it is that makes a man. It's about being protective and strong and stoic uh, and things like that. And and I thought, is that is that really what being a man is? And I, and, I, and it's because he said that it is whilst, of course, trying to defend his webcam business and whilst sitting in Romania on charges of sex trafficking and all sorts of stuff. Although, of course, from the interview, as we saw, he denies everything. Um, and what's worrying, I suppose, is that his words and the things that he says are are parroted by really quite young boys in schools now um, because, as we've said, there is this kind of vacuum. So if they're not being told what a, a man is or could be in a positive sense, then they'll get it from where they get it. And they're getting it on from watching YouTube or social media or whatever. And uh, it's amazing how much they can hoover up uh, like sponges and then regurgitate with 100% confidence because of the way that Tate himself speaks. And I totally understand why. Like in the book, I recount a friend of mine who was just incredibly distressed that um, her nephew, who'd been raised by good liberal Guardian reading parents, was now a massive fan of Andrew Tate and indeed ruined Christmas dinner because he kept quoting Andrew Tate and made their niece cry and leave the table. And they were going, we don't understand why. We're good liberal left wing people. How have we raised someone who's so into this misogynist? Yeah. And I was like, well, it's because you're good liberal left wing people. Because are you having these kind of conversations? Ha, huh, men. Typical straight white men, toxic masculinity. Is it that everything that your 15 year old son or nephew has heard recently has generally been about how, you know, men are bad and all the bad things in the world are male and the future is female? Because, of course, in that, you know, first of all, if you're making someone feel guilt and shame for how they were born as a straight white boy, that's the definition of bigotry. Yeah. Like, kind of, that is that that we we know that that's wrong if you're of color, if you're a woman, if you're LGBTQI. So if you if you're making straight white boys feel shame for how they were born, we've got a problem. Mm. And at the moment, Andrew Tate has given the solution, which is to be the only person standing up going, "No, if you feel bad about this stuff, and that's woke them gone mad, you know, we need to go." You know, and I can see why is that you know he's quite a simple thinker for all of his long words. Why he's gone well, the thing that would make things better is if we turn back time mm. and go back to a point where no one thought that straight white men were awful go back to the time when straight white men were dominant like and that's and that necessitates women being inferior and having power over them that's what's going to make you feel better if you have power over women and what you've done there is you've confused power over people which will not help you but will not solve this huge howling void that you have and all these confusions and vulnerabilities and anxieties you have what you need is empowerment you know, you need to learn how to be able to talk to people about your emotions. You need to learn to have the strength to be vulnerable. You need to learn how to get on with people. If you think you're falling behind at school because the educational system is is biased towards treat, um, teaching girls better, which a lot of studies suggest it is, mm. then you need to, that's sort of that thing you need to campaign about. You need to prevent, you know, present evidence and change this in the way that feminism did mm. when things were tilted towards men. Like, kind of like, you need to be empowered to basically have the skills that women have gained over the last 50 years, which is to confess your problems and anxieties, be vulnerable about them, analyse why these things have happened and suggest solutions. Like, you know, running a sex cam operation in Romania and smoking a cigar and shouting top G, that's not a movement. You know, that, that, that's, that's a pyramid scheme with an arse at the top of it. Like, kind of, it's not, you know, he's not the male Jermaine Greer. Like, he, this is not the road to freedom. But then you talk to teachers, and I went on Twitter and asked about this, and, like, you know, teachers in almost every school in the country will report how, how often Andrew Tate fans are disrupting lessons. Female teachers saying that, like, when boys hand in essays, they've written M-M-A-S at the bottom, which stands for make me a sandwich. Like, mm. you know, you shouldn't be a teacher, you should be in the kitchen. A male teacher going, yeah, I was asked if I allow my wife out on her own. Like, kind of, these are, you know, this is deeply disturbing stuff. Yeah. Like, and and at the end of it, it means that these boys are going to continue to academically fail because if you're that disruptive, if you're just going into school to make your political points that you're parroting from Andrew Tate, you're not going to pass those GCSEs and you're going to become part of the, the system that, you, that makes you so depressed, which is boys failing academically, failing to go on to further education, not getting the high paid jobs. Um, and, you know, the, these are the things that make boys feel, ultimately make boys feel insecure and scared. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let, let's have a look at a bit of systemic change rather than just shouting top G over everything. <laughs> I mean, those are some of the, I suppose, the the, the negative uh, role models. Um, you do point out that there are positive role models out there if if you go looking for them. But you also uh, do this thing where you sort of think, what what are the positive things that we can say about masculinity rather than the, the negative traits? 
And that's a, well, it's a very funny section because, as you discovered, you, you when you do this, you realise that you're describing a dog rather yes. than a man. Um, but but it's really interesting when you looked at the, some of the personal examples in your own life where you talk talk about the times when men accepted you without judgment and protected you and all that sort of stuff. And it's really important, isn't it, that we if we can put a, a name to these things, that therefore young boys will see that those are the things that they can uh, sort of aim towards and not feel bad about. Well, the solution to everything, I mean, I very much believe that like just, you know, going around and saying, no, down with this, ban this, trash this is is nothing. Like you see, and this is why social media, like, you know, is so toxic. The solution on social media is that if that someone perceives that someone else has done something wrong, that they're just like, no, this should be banned. There should be no platforms. You should delete your tweet. You know, you need to change your mind. This just needs to go because I think I am right and I know a better way. But rather than going through the long and arduous process of destroying someone else and someone else's argument and kind of getting them to delete it or getting them no platform, why don't you just go to straight to the next bit that would have to happen anyway, which is you providing a better alternative. Mm. You don't need to go around trashing the things that you think are wrong. Just show the things that you think are right. And that's harder, and that's why people don't do it. It's far easier to just go online and just go, well, you're wrong, screw you, delete your, delete your account, yeah. rather than sit down and go, well, what would be better? Why do I think they're wrong? I will give you an alternative. And in culture, we've really... You know, particularly for men at the moment, you know, but again, this is generally a thing in popular culture. We we don't have in our minds enough that the most important thing, which is you always need to increase the lexicon. You always need to be expanding choice. If you think everything out there is awful, rather than spending five years and like you know peevishly campaigning against it, just start providing something better. Yeah, that's how market economy works. You know, mm. that's how the intellectual economy works. It should be a marketplace of ideas. But instead, we spend a lot of time sort of like, you know, just, just talking people down. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book rather than, you know, talk about all these problems that men have. And it could easily have been a book about just literally going through all the things that men do that are really screwed up and going, you got this wrong, you got this wrong, you're making that lady sad here, screw you. And instead, I wanted to make the book... I see why you're doing these things. I understand that. Tell me more about this. And here's how it could be better. Here's what I think would be a better life for you. Here are better role models for you. And we just need to promote the role models that we think are great. And it's and it's very hard to find them at the moment. We don't need, and you know, if you, if you ask any woman who are the 50 greatest women in the world right now, you'll go Greta Thunberg, you know, Beyonce, like, you know, Jacinta Arden, you can list millions of them. We don't really do those lists of 50 great men at the moment. Hmm. You know, we have 50 young men who are going to change the world in the way that we do for young women and even when i typed in most loved men in the world the first 20 charts that came up were most powerful men in the world which right. is a very different thing and again part of the problem like kind of you know who do we love and then when you finally get to the who we love we love tom hanks we love keanu reeves we love david attenborough we love barack obama we love paul mccartney that's who we need to be you know focusing on like who's actually who seems happy and is loved and is doing this right and appears to be adding to the world mm. Um, you know, who isn't really causing an argument or a hoo-ha because we just look at them and go, oh, that's great. Wow, that's <laughs> fun. He's smashing. And we don't really talk about lovable men and adorable men and men that we just make us feel warm inside at the moment. And I think that's a really important thing. Yeah. Um, that That's the big missing thing for me, love for men and young boys at the moment. We only ever have, oh, it's all going wrong from the conversations. And I want us to have a conversation of this is where it's going right because that's what feminism did. Yeah. We would look at these brilliant women, look at these inspiring women. Here are your new heroes. We're going to provide you with so much inspiration. You will want to be these girls. We're not doing that for boys at the moment. You you mentioned that this book sort of was born out of the questions you were asked when you were promoting the, the books that you'd written about women. And, and somebody would stand up at an event and say, yeah, but what about men? Have you got any advice for men? Um, obviously, we're doing this interview ahead of the publication of the book. So you're about to head out on the road and do more events for this book. What do you hope uh, might happen in the question and answer sessions at the end of those events um i mean other than people going you've totally got it right Kim. <laughs> i have literally nothing else to add job done <laughs> um, I, i'm really hoping that my kind of like that this uh, the thing that i thought that worked that i observed worked really well with how to be a woman is that i found a way to talk about feminism that just made it look like fun yeah. and being a woman where you could live a life with no shame where confessing your secrets was rewarded and celebrated where talking about answers made people enthusiastic and excited and i saw girls change the way they talked about themselves and their problems and how they were going to solve them and feminism and what i really hope that i'm doing with that with this new book what about men is that i can do the same for men that it's a template for a conversation it's a tone that they can go, oh, finally, I know how I can talk about a thing I'm scared about. I finally see how I can talk about a thing I'm anxious about. 
I now want to go and do this. And I came across so many brilliant initiatives around the country that, again, don't get the same publicity as initiatives for women do because we're just not in that climate at the moment. Mm. There's, one, there's the um, there's the shared organisation where sort of men go to, you know, every sort of area, you know, hopefully at some point, but a lot already have them, have a shed where they find that men are better at talking emotionally and honestly to each other when they're doing something. So the idea is you go to a shed and, like, there's men there and you tinker with things, you, like, you mend your lawnmower, like, you're, you know, you're doing a bit of carpentry and stuff, and during the course of you making a thing, you then get to talk and make friends. Mm. Little initiatives like this that are just so, you know, everyone needs a place to go and some people that they can talk to about these things. And the idea of starting a conversation where we're like, yeah, where can boys go? What can they do while they're there? What will be the tone that they will talk to each other about? What are the ideas that we know that we want to discuss? And just get to the point where we're sort of scanning the culture in the same way they do for women now, going, you know, like in the last year, menopause. Like, you know, that, that's mm. huge. Suddenly everyone's talking about menopause and we're coming up with these solutions. There's legislation, there's products, like there's podcasts, everything. We should be doing that with the problems of men. Let's talk about loneliness. Let's talk about suicide. Let's talk about body image. Let's talk about addiction to pornography. Let's talk about sexual strangulation. These should be as common currency as us talking about endometriosis or menopause or infertility or motherhood or kind of you know all the things that we talk about that are female problems and get so much publicity should be the same for boys no wonder they feel sort of neglected because we don't have those big this is the week we're talking about this let's solve it (laughs) i did say at the beginning that i could quite happily sort of talk about every chapter of this book but i do want to leave something for people to discover including the line that you have about jordan b peterson that made me bark with laughter so loud that my wife thought i was having some kind of stroke or something um one about his bowels by any chance well it it was the one about actually it was the one where you were talking about um if somebody's cherry picking uh something like the lobsters it's it's uh it's usually because they're trying to explain why they're being a cunt (laughs) (laughs) i stand by that i absolutely stand by that and also the other thing which is really key is like never trust a lone preacher man when people go he's the only one saying that he's a lone preacher man out in the desert it's like Never trust a lone preacher man. Why is he alone? Why is why 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 is no one else? He's, why is he not in a gang? Why is no one his friend? Why is he the only person saying this? These are all red flags for me. Yeah. Never listen to a lone preacher man. <laughs> Caitlin, it's been so great to speak to you uh, about this book. Thank you so much. And as I say, for, as as a man myself, but also as a parent, I found it really really insightful. Um, so you've done a fantastic job with all your conversations with your friends. So thank you. Oh God, thank you so much. You're the first man that I've talked to about this, and I'm so pleased to hear that it's like resonated because that's the way you know I know women and I'm just making a guess with men so I really I'm so thrilled that you said that well remember I'm a slightly girly man so I might not be the best litmus test here but you know okay. lots of men are girly men yeah, so that's, right. I'll, that's <laughs> enough to get in the top 10 so that's fine <laughs> <laughs> what about men by Caitlin Moran is out now and for a limited time you can find signed copies in shops or on waterstones.com